The following presentation covers the month of March 1861 from a grand theater perspective. In March 1861, President-elect Abraham Lincoln is in Washington. The United States garrison at Fort Sumter off Charleston, South Carolina, remains isolated, as does the garrison at Fort Pickens off Pensacola, Florida. Seven states have seceded from the Union since December. South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas have left the Union. Montgomery, Alabama is the seat of the Confederate government. In Richmond, Virginia, a convention is in session to discuss Virginia's options in the present crisis. If Virginia joins the secession movement, the Southern Confederacy will gain a significant boost in population and economic power. The United States is keenly interested in keeping Virginia out of the secession movement. On March 1, 1861, President James Buchanan is in his final few days as President of the United States. Abraham Lincoln is to be inaugurated on March 4th. Months of tension have built over Lincoln's upcoming inauguration this month. In Washington, General Winfield Scott has hundreds of troops to maintain order. But there is some show of loyalty from the Upper South. On March 2nd, in Washington, on the Senate floor, a Tennessee senator named Andrew Johnson declares his loyalty to the Union. Large, animated crowds are in the Senate galleries. Senator Johnson is confident his state of Tennessee will remain faithful to the Union, causing cheers and applause. Support from senators like Andrew Johnson provide hope that the Upper South states like Tennessee will reject secession and remain loyal to the Union. Also on March 2nd, at Galveston, Texas, the United States revenue cutter, the Dodge, is seized. The ship is turned over from the United States to the state of Texas. March 3rd, in Washington, large crowds continue to gather in the Senate Hall. Senator John Crittenden of Kentucky, who had long attempted to reconcile North and South through compromise, tries to speak about the looming danger in his farewell address. However, the noise in the Senate gallery overwhelms the speaker. The crowds in the gallery are cleared. After the crowd is cleared, Senator Crittenden said, We are one people of the same blood and of one family, and we must compromise all family troubles. He continued, I am for the Union. I am not for secession. No, sir. And as to my native state, I will say to her, more than to others, I desire to see you stand by the union of the country. Also on March 3rd, in Norfolk, Virginia, there is concern that Lincoln's inauguration the following day will cause disorder. Volunteers patrol the city. Pro-secession workers at the Navy Yard are discharged. We will zoom into the Fort Sumter, Charleston, South Carolina region. Charleston, South Carolina proper is to the left. Major Robert Anderson's United States garrison is at Fort Sumter in the harbor. The Confederates have control of fortifications ringing the harbor. On March 3rd, General Pierre Beauregard assumes command of the rebel forces there. He is directly facing Major Anderson's United States garrison at Fort Sumter. Charleston is armed and ready to defend itself. Eyes and ears will wait for the next day, March 4th, Inauguration Day. We will zoom back out. March 4th arrives, Inauguration Day in Washington. Some 600 troops are in the city to keep peace. Chief Justice Taney administers the oath to Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln is now President of the United States. Lincoln had remained tight-lipped until this moment, but now he is the President and he is free to articulate the policy of his administration. Lincoln addresses the crowd. He begins with reconciliation to the Southern states. He says, I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. Those who nominated and elected me did so with full knowledge that I have made this and many similar declarations, and I have never recanted them. Then Lincoln draws a line. His stance is different than President Buchanan's. From Lincoln's perspective, secession is not constitutional. His words are, I hold that, 
In contemplation of universal law and of the Constitution, the union of these states is perpetual. Perpetuity is implied, if not expressed, in the fundamental law of all national governments. It is safe to assert that no government proper ever had a provision in its organic law for its own termination. The Union is much older than the Constitution. It was formed, in fact, by the Articles of Association in 1774. It was matured and continued by the Declaration of Independence in 1776. It was further matured, and the faith of all the then 13 states expressly plighted and engaged that it should be perpetual, and by the Articles of Confederation in 1778. And finally, in 1787, one of the declared ob objects for ordaining and establishing the Constitution was to form a more perfect union. Then Lincoln turns the table on the secessionists. Whereas the secessionists have claimed the North is acting as the aggressor, Lincoln holds that the United States will not use force unless attacked. Lincoln's words are, in doing this, there needs to be no bloodshed or violence, and there shall be none, unless it be forced upon the national authority. The power confided to me will be used to hold, occupy, and possess the property and places belonging to the government, and to collect the duties and imposts. Lincoln articulates the inherent error with secession, that a nation formed by secession will likely just produce future secession, and government will be impossible. Lincoln says, Why may not any portion of a new confederacy a year or two hence arbitrarily secede again, precisely as portions of the present Union now claim to secede from it? Lincoln concludes his inaugural speech with a plea to the citizens of the seceding states. He says, In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. I am loath to close. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passions may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic chords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land, will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched, as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. March 4, 1861 is Abraham Lincoln's first day as President of the United States. In his first speech as President, he explains that he will not initiate force against the secessionists, but if force is used against the United States, it is his constitutional obligation to preserve the more perfect union established by the Founding Fathers. The inauguration runs without disruption. On Inauguration Day, the new Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, reports that the United States Navy has 42 commission ships in the fleet. Also on March 4th, in Montgomery, Alabama, the capital of the Confederacy, the Confederate Congress adopts a national flag. Northern newspapers are reporting that 30,000 volunteers are drilling in the South. The next day, March 5th, in Washington, two Confederate commissioners, John Forsyth and Martin Crawford, have arrived to open relations between the United States and the declared independent nation of the Confederacy. However, the new Secretary of State, William Seward, is now armed with the philosophy of Lincoln's administration, which had just been outlined the day before at the inauguration. Seward relays to the Confederate commissioners that no states have the right to secede from the country, therefore their claim to represent an independent nation is void. Seward will not give the Confederate commissioners audience, nor recognize the Confederacy as a nation. March 7. In Mobile, Alabama, train cars arrive from Richmond, Virginia. They are carrying artillery and carriages. Suspiciously, Virginia, a state in the Union, is providing arms to Alabama, a state in secession. March 9. In Richmond, Virginia, the majority report in the Virginia Convention proclaims the importance of states' rights, stating, It is the duty, therefore, of the common government to respect the rights of the states and the equality of the people thereof. 
the Virginia Convention's majority also made resolutions on slavery, stating, African slavery is a vital part of the social systems of the state wherein it exists. Any interference to its prejudice by the federal authority or by the authorities of the other states or by the people thereof is in derogation from plain right, contrary to the Constitution, offensive and dangerous. The Virginia Convention also discusses United States forts, stating, Whilst the state remains in the Union, the legitimate use of such forts is to protect the country against foreign force and to aid in suppressing domestic insurrection, to use or prepare them to be used to intimidate a state or constrain its free action is a perversion of the purposes for which they were obtained. They were not intended to be used against the states in whose limits they are found in the event of civil war. Virginia plans to meet with commissioners from other Upper South states like Maryland, North Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, and Arkansas. A convention of these Upper South states is planned to meet at Frankfort, Kentucky in May. On March 11th, in Montgomery, Alabama, the Confederate Congress adopts a permanent constitution for the Confederacy. The Confederate Constitution provides a representation criteria for the states. South Carolina will have six congressional representatives, Georgia will have 10 representatives, Alabama 9, Florida 2, Mississippi 7, Louisiana 6, and Texas 6. The Confederate Constitution maintains the three-fifths clause to tabulate slave representation. It also establishes special protections for slavery. The Confederate Constitution explicitly states that the right of property in said slaves shall not be thereby impaired. The Confederate Constitution protects slavery in all future territories it shall acquire, declaring in all such territory the institution of slavery as it now exists in the Confederate States shall be recognized and protected by Congress and by the territorial government. March 12th, in Richmond, Virginia, at the Virginia Convention, there is discussion over the recent Peace Conference resolutions. The Peace Conference provides for the protection of slavery in states where it exists in exchange for loyalty to the United States. Advocates of the Peace Conference resolutions are appealing to the interests of slave states to keep the Upper South in the country. Also on March 12th, in Baltimore, the Maryland State Convention is in session to discuss what course that state should take. States like Maryland, a social and economic mixture of North and South, lying in between the free Northern states and the cash crop slave states, are referring to themselves as border states at this time. The Maryland delegates want to act in accord with Virginia which at this time is also considered a border state. We will zoom in to Fort Sumter at Charleston, South Carolina. By March 13, newspapers are swirling with rumors that Fort Sumter is to be evacuated, but official sources do not corroborate this claim. Fort Sumter's situation is very difficult. The large Navy ship, the Brooklyn, is too large to enter Charleston Harbor's shallow waters. In addition, the Navy only has 11 vessels in its home fleet. Even though Major Anderson at Fort Sumter is deep in hostile territory, he has been provisioning his garrison with meat and butter from a vendor in Charleston. At least for now, somewhere in Charleston, a business owner is happy to sell food to the Yankees. There is very serious concern that even an unarmed supply ship sent to Fort Sumter will be fired on by Charleston artillery, essentially initiating a civil war. At this time, newspapers report that in Charleston, the rebel general, Pierre Beauregard, was recruiting 400 artillerymen. Beauregard is said to be placing artillery in position and preparing the city for sea attack. We will zoom back out. March 16, in Texas, Governor Sam Houston is required to take an oath to the Confederacy. Sam Houston, however, is loyal to the United States and he refuses the oath of secession. Governor Houston is removed from office for refusing to take the oath of secession. March 19. In St. Louis, Missouri, the convention in that state overwhelmingly rejects secession. On March 20th, in Little Rock, Arkansas, 
The state convention there is looking for a constitutional resolution to the crisis. For now, Arkansas remains a border state. March 22nd, in St. Louis, Missouri, Chairman Henderson at the Missouri Convention asked the seceding states to desist from revolutionary measures and reunite with the Union. We will zoom into the Fort Pickens, Pensacola, Florida region. Fort Pickens, here off Pensacola, Florida, is surrounded by rebel posts on the mainland, just like Fort Sumter at Charleston. On March 22nd, Confederate General Braxton Bragg forbids any vessels to provide supplies to United States ships or Fort Pickens. Bragg has a significant number of troops congregating at Pensacola. By March 24th, the large United States ship, the Brooklyn, is positioned near Fort Pickens. We will zoom out. Also on March 24th, at Fort Sumter off Charleston, United States Naval Officer Fox has arrived to visit Anderson's garrison. Fox will report back to Washington that Fort Sumter can stretch its supplies until the middle of April. March 25th, in Washington, President Lincoln receives word from Richmond that secession fever is sweeping that city. It is reported in newspapers that Lincoln is considering evacuating Fort Sumter and Fort Pickens in order to appease the Virginia Convention. It is widely discussed by this time that any use of force by the United States, any attempt to collect revenues from the South, or any closure of Southern ports may result in the immediate secession of Virginia and other border states. We will zoom into the Washington region. If Virginia secedes and Maryland follows in her wake as its convention claims it may, the capital of the United States, where Abraham Lincoln resides, Congress meets, and the Supreme Court deliberates, will be isolated in foreign territory. Washington might then fall into the hands of the Confederacy. We will zoom back out. March 26th. In Memphis, Tennessee, Mississippi troops arrive in town by train and parade through the city at Great Fanfare, a martial display for the border state residents. Local crowds cheer on the troops. By the end of March 1861, the United States garrisons at Fort Sumter and Fort Pickens have only become more desperate for supply and reinforcement. Virginia and other border states appear willing to secede at the onset of any hostility. The new president, Abraham Lincoln, must decide if he is to appease the Upper South or determine to show resolve.